Everybody okay with 19? For I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. What would we say to indicate that we're okay with it? Would seem so. 20 reads, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer then I who live, but Christ lives in me. So this is now the experience that the old man has died and Paul thinks of himself as being, and that is his tense is, I have been, perfect tense, I have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, uh, but Christ lives in me. So I've got someone else living within me, and the life which I now live, so he does live, but he, I now live, I live it in the flesh, and I live by the faith in or of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, God for if righteousness comes through the law... Christ died needlessly. There's no need for Christ to die if the law can make you righteous. The fact that it can't means that you do need to have a righteousness apart from the law, to use the expression of Romans. So, so what does it mean that I do not nullify the grace of God? I do not or I cannot? No, I do not. Uh, because I, he live, I do not, by living this way, mm. I don't nullify the grace of God. I, in fact... Um, Recognise that if righteousness had have come through the law, well then Christ died for nothing. Recognising the giving of the law as the grace of God. Yes, for a, an increase of the transgression so that I might despair, understand and go, go to Christ for that which only he can give. Mm. Um, verse 20, it says, I live by faith, and the end of this is in the Son of God, and I've got it crossed out and put off. Mm. So, I mean, there's a deeper meaning that yes, there is. faith comes from God to live. And the, the, and the faith of the Son of God is because he lived a life of trust in his Father, I can live a life of trust. So if Christ is living in me, even though I live in the flesh, that is in a mortal body that is compromised with a whole set of other things, Romans 7, nevertheless, um, I do live by the faith of the Son of God. That is, if there's... Remember how it says in Hebrews, he is the pioneer of our faith. So that he's the first cab off the rank who breaks, breaks through and trusts God as only a man or human should. Uh, he's done that for us. So we live by the faith of the Son of God. Uh, now it's true, we do live by faith in the Son of God insofar that he's the object of our trust, but not for our life, but he's normally the object of our trust for our, for, by his death and by his blood and by his forgiveness. But to, to live now is to live by the faith of the Son of God who's in me. Now, it's true, by the Spirit will be the way that's done. But that's what I was going to say. Yeah. <clears throat> it's through the Spirit that lives within you. Yes, but it's important to see that, that as we've been saying before, that the work of the Spirit is not confused with the work of Jesus. It's the faith of Jesus that has brought us to faith itself because he's trusted God for us in our place and... And then he's lived a faithful life. And he's done everything by faith. He's done everything by trusting in his Father. And you're right, the Spirit will impart that life because being the Spirit of Christ, he will impart Christ's life. But, but, but he is the imparter of the life. He is not the person of faith that Christ was. Because we need, we, we need, we need a man, we, we need a human to have done certain things for us. And only, only a human can have faith, in this sense. And so uh, the faith of the Son of God is the basis for our life. We're just simply rolling in on his faith now. He's the pioneer of our faith and 
you're following him. Um, but this will be by the Spirit that we have such experience of that life. That's mm -hmm. perfectly right. Okay. Well, I'm moving to chapter 3 now, which is uh, opening up. Uh, it's probably the second part, as we might say, of this particular book. And... Um, And in this section, he's, um, he's wanting to state to them in three verses, one to five, this is an argument from their experience, an argument from the fact that they already know these things in God themselves. So what on earth are they doing going back to law because these people from Jerusalem have come and said, you've got to do this. He says, well, I can't believe you're doing this. You, you, you must be bewitched. It's, it's, it's occult. I can't believe it. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now, portrayed, I think, by the preaching of Paul. I think they'd seen Christ crucified, these people in Galatia. You say you don't, or do you think? No, I didn't. No, no they, he, Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Remember, Paul says, I preach Christ and him crucified. So, y yes, I think his preaching sufficiently portrayed a crucified saviour. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now that's an expression we'll hear a lot about in Romans 10. Hearing with faith. Now it just might be worthwhile to go back to Romans 10. You remember Romans is going to be written after this. <coughs> so it will be expanded. If ever you're stuck about Galatians, go to Romans. It'll normally spell it out in higher detail. <coughs> I'm thinking of Romans 10, I think. Yes, it is. I'll stick your finger in Galatians 3. I'm coming back, but... In Galatians 10, he's opening an argument uh, about uh, the whole idea that um, why is it that um, the Jewish people did not actually respond? He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is their salvation. For I do bear them witness, they have a zeal for God, but it's not in accordance with knowledge. That is, it's, it's an ignorant zeal. It's, they're zealous, but they don't know stuff. And what they don't know is... For not knowing about God's righteousness, that is the one he has to give us as a gift, and seeking to establish their own, that is by their works, they do not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. So they never knew, or they didn't know, that God has a righteousness to give, as a gift. And so he makes a conclusion. These fours are often the way he expresses that. For Christ is the end of the law. He is the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So if you said to yourself, uh, shall I try and be a righteous person by doing the law and keeping everything? He says, no, Christ is the end of that. He, he, he's the person who's, who's stopped that because he has brought you a righteousness of his own as a gift. But it's for everyone who believes. It's not for people who don't. For Moses writes, and now he gives you some examples, Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. So what Moses is saying is if you want to live by the law, you better do the whole of it and you better live by that righteousness. So we're now talking about a righteousness which, which is based on law and a righteousness that's based on faith in what Jesus Christ has done as a gift for you. The righteousness based on faith says, talks like this. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down. Deuteronomy 30 verse 12. Worth looking up because the context makes it sing. <coughs> Excuse me. Deuteronomy 30 verse 12. And it's helpful to read this because what you'll find is um, Moses is making a clear point.
He's talking about their restoration, really. And God will restore their captivity. It was 30, 12, was it? Yeah, 30 verses 1 to 10 and then to 12, yeah. How the word of God is near. Have a look at 30, 11. This commandment which I preach to you today, I command to you today, is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It's not in heaven that you should say, who'll go up to heaven and get for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? No, nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? He says the word of God is very near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. So what he's telling them is that the word of God is near, but it is a matter of the heart and it's a matter of the hand, and it's not remote. He says God is not a God who is up there, out there, somewhere else, where, where whatever he's speaking, I don't know what he's speaking, but I'd have to go there and find out and bring it back so he can do it. He says, no, 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 it's perfectly near you. It's right where you are. The word of God is in your, in, in your hands, but more particularly in your mouth because you're talking it and it's in your heart. Now go back to Romans 10, and what Paul is saying is, the righteousness based on faith speaks thus, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? <laughs> now, he, he gives you, and my text puts it in brackets, probably yours does too, that is to bring Christ down. Mm. See, the whole idea is Christ has ascended. Well, how, how shall we know what he's telling us? Oh, well, we don't have to go up there and get him. He says, what does it say? He says, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. And now he tells you what that is. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. So he's actually saying, just as Moses brought the command of God by speaking it out of his mouth and people heard it right there and then and could talk it back and have it in their mouth and on their heart, so he says, we preachers of the gospel, we, these apostles, he says, what is this word? It's the word which we are preaching. It's a word of faith which we're preaching. By, that, by a word of faith he means a word which is asking you to put your trust in Christ. And he says, we're preaching it, that if you confess with your mouth, here he comes about mouth and heart, confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So do you see how he's used the Deuteronomic text? Mouth, heart, near, remote, he's actually got that idea clear. And so what he's on about is, this is the word of God which we are preaching. Now, the way he puts that in verse 8 of chapter 10 of Romans is the word of faith. All right? Now here, in turning back to Galatians, you'll hear the same thing. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith. Now that's spelt out in Romans, but it's a little short. It's always short summary in Galatians. It's a hard book to know for that reason. This is why Luther spent three years expounding it, uh, because he was really expounding Romans through Galatians. Are you so foolish? So he says you've received Holy Spirit by believing with faith or hearing with faith. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Are you going back to fleshy, fleshy effort of law-keeping, for goodness sake? Did you suffer so many things in vain? Which implies they did, if indeed it was in vain. That is, I'm not believing you have turned yet, but you're pretty close, so I'm giving you a bit of a warning. Does he then who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, which is clearly happening, does he do it by works of the law? or by hearing with faith? <clears throat> so this is his set of questions. How did you get to have an experience of the Spirit? By hearing with faith, not works of the law. How are all the miracles done among you? Yeah, oh, they're done by hearing with faith, not by works of the law. So he said, come on, you've got this experience already in your life. Why would you ever go back to laws and rules and commandments? These people from Jerusalem are talking to you when actually you already know the power of God and you know the of the faith that you have in Christ. can't believe you'd shift on that. 
So he now brings them to quite a long argument. Even so, Abram believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. See, this is, this is what worked out in Romans 4. Therefore, be sure that you should be sure that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations shall be blessed in you. So there's the bit about the Gentiles, the nations. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. If you're going to go back to law, he said, you'll go back to curse. It's written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. <coughs> now, that's a quotation from Deuteronomy 27. So he's actually saying, now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, because the righteous man shall live by faith. He's quoting that from Habakkuk 2.4. So he's really just rolling out all the Romans texts, which are, he's going to obviously expand in the later letter however the law is not of faith on the contrary he who practices them shall live for them live by them that it's a matter of practice matter of doing christ redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us for it's written cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree now that's an important thing <clears throat> A man is not cursed because he hangs on a tree. He hangs on a tree because he's cursed. <laughs> Meaning, it's because he's sinned and he's committed a crime that he is then hung on a tree. So in other words, cursed is the person who hangs on a tree is a statement which is imagining someone looking at a person hanging on a tree, dead body, and saying, oh, cursed is the man who hangs on a tree. The answer is he must have done something wrong to in order to be on a tree. Now, Christ was on a tree and he was hung on a tree and he has become accursed for us. In other words, he has borne the curse of the law. That is, everyone who doesn't perform the law is cursed. Christ was hung on a tree, therefore was cursed. Was he cursed because he didn't do it? No, because he, did, he, did, because he took the curse for us. Why? Verse 14 in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abram might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So he's back to the promise of the Spirit which he raised in verse 3 and 4 and 5. So, has, so, so do, we get, do we get this argument? Do we see how he's working? He's got a, he's got a set, of, set of principles that he's putting forward. He's saying Abram was a man of faith. And he believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. That's, that's just a way he... How was, how was Abraham reckoned righteous by God? Because he trusted him. Ah, oh. well, that would mean then that everybody who trusts God like Abraham does is really behaving like a child copying their father, Abraham, because children copy their parents. So he's going to call us children of Abraham by copy. You okay with that? Sometimes you, you copy someone who isn't your real dad, but you copy them, and in doing them, you treat them as if they are a dad because they're people that you copy. <laughs> they become a mentor to you. That's the modern jargon today, but it won't be quite the same thing. So in that case, everyone who copies Abram is treating him as a father, and therefore we are the children of Abraham because we too approach God through the same way he did. Is that all right so far? Second, he now says, and, that's the, and the scripture actually foresaw this. Notice how the scripture is personified here as a person. It foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith because the promise all the nations shall be blessed in you. Is that what it means? Exactly that. So what is the blessing of all the nations through Abram? Says Paul, easy, Holy Spirit. He explains that by verse 14. Promise of the Spirit. So how do, they, how do people, for example, Galatians, who are Gentiles, how do they get to have the Holy Spirit? Because they surely have it. <laughs> they have him because they've got it. 3, 1 to 5 tells them that. So he's saying, how did you get the Spirit, you people? Well, it's, that was promised as a blessing of the nations. Yes, yes. How did that come? Well, you trusted like Abram did. 
And you also understand that you're free from the curse of the law because Christ has become that curse for you. In which case he's redeemed you from the curse of the law. Why would you ever go back to doing law stuff? Which you're just going to fail at anyway. Why would you do that? Because he's cursed for, he becomes a curse for us for us because he was cursed because he hung on a tree. So he's made that his steps of argument. Everybody okay with that? Yeah? Now he moves into a much more difficult argument to follow. So it's one that is built upon an, an understanding of um, the Greek word diatheke means a covenant, but it can also mean a testament in the sense of a will. Uh, you see it used as, as the idea of a will in Hebrews, but it's the same word. Brethren, if I speak in terms of human relations, that is, I'm going to give you an example. This is a powerful use, really. If I um, speak to you um, of the terms of human relations, even though it's only a man's covenant, yet when it's been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. You appreciate you can write a codicil for a will, which makes a little... A little a man can write a will, and then he says, oh, I don't think I like that very much. I think I'll include Auntie Mill and Uncle Jack. Then he adds at the bottom, and Uncle Jack, and he signs, and, and the witness signs. That's a codicil. That's an addition to a will which is done, but it's always done before the person dies. Otherwise, it's dodgy and someone's fiddled with the will. Yeah? Paul is now saying this. When it's been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now, the promises are spoken to Abram and to his seed. He does not say unto seeds, plural, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. Now, you and I would say the word seed is a collective noun, and like sheep or <coughs> flock, a flock of sheep is a, plural, is a plurality, although it's one, and it's important to think of it like that. We would say seed... We can use that as a collective of many seeds. Or uh, it can be taken as one seed. And Paul has taken the, the Genesis text as one. But you appreciate he's dealing with everybody in the one seed. <coughs> Do you see what we're doing here? This is quite an important idea. If you and I think of seed... We would say that can be lots and lots and lots of seeds, plural, because we're thinking of seed as a collective noun. <coughs> Paul is actually saying, no, it's not because of the collective nature of the noun that we can say you're included. There was only really only one seed, and that's Christ. So that interprets seed as one. Ah, but in Christ, everybody's been dealt with. So that he's saying the collective application of this comes out of Christ being a person for everyone, not out of a collective noun of many seeds. You see that? What an important idea. But so, seeds have got to germinate. Uh, well, they do indeed, but it's important. But that's not, not germane to this um, argument. What he's saying is... <clears throat> he's saying, I, I, in, your, in your seed shall all the nations be blessed. Everyone would have taken that to mean the Jews. Which is true as to sperm and offspring coming from his sperm. So in that sense, this means Jews. But we're not Jews, we're Galatians, we're Gentiles. He says, well actually, says Paul, the seed is one of them. There's only one real seed of Abraham, it's Christ. But in Christ, Jew and Gentile are caught up in that. So that the collect, the, my word, the collectiveness is found here, not here. It allows him to exclude Jews. Okay. 
Now, the promise is spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say unto seeds, but to you. One seed is Christ. What I'm saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. Now, that's a piece of history, so we need to be pretty sure about this. What he's saying is that here, he's saying that um, Abram was given a promise and then 430 years after Abram, Moses came with the law. The law does not in any sense invalidate the promise because the promise has been done and dusted and <coughs> ratified and settled. So he's saying the law can't change the promise, and the promise is prior to law. That's his argument. Now he'll go on and explain in this way. If the inheritance is based on law, it's no longer based on promise. But God has granted it to Abram by means of a promise. So you have to decide, is it by law, 450 years later, or is it by promise? If it's by promise, it's not by law, and if by law, it's not by promise. They're mutually exclusive because they're actually separated in space and time, but more importantly, they're very different things. One's about performance, the other is about a gift, and so on. So what he's actually going to say here is, then God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. So at the end of verse 18, you should be pretty satisfied in your own mind that God made a promise and that's like a testament which is a play on the, on the word because the word means both and that no one can change it once it's made and certainly the law can't change it once it's made I mean Abram's promise, God's promise to Abram is fixed in which case the law has nothing to do with the promise and the promise nothing to do with the law with regards to its fulfilment so far Thus far, verse 18, yep. Every Jew would ask an important question then. Why the law? Why would you ever have law in the first place? So you've just destroyed, Paul. You've just destroyed the whole meaning of law. What's the point of the law then? Come on now, that's an important question. He says it is indeed. We're about to answer that. Why the law? Well, it was added because of transgressions having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. He's saying you need the law because transgressions were done and the power of law is it shows you what transgressions are. So it has a halting effect. It also has, of course... Um, and not just a halting effect but a multiplying effect but that's, but that's the reverse issue he's raising to this one he's saying but it was ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator and his understanding of it's being ordained through angels by a mediator is that uh, you see the same argument raised in Hebrews chapter 2 stick your finger in Galatians 3 have a look at Hebrews 2 because it runs the same argument. Mm. Having told you that angels are ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who inherit salvation, 114, Hebrews 2 says, For this reason we must pay closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. If the words spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and obedience received a just recompense. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, the apostles, God bearing witness with them both by signs and wonders, and by various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Notice the same argument Paul is raising in Galatians 3. He did not subject angels to the world to come, concerning which we're speaking, but he subjected him, Jesus, 6, 7, 8, 
and in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing unsubjected. We don't, still, we don't see that yet, but we do see Jesus made lower than the angels because of the suffering of death. He is crowned that he might taste death for everyone. So the argument is that the law came through angelic mediation to Moses. And so he's got it like this. God has... Um, uh, uh, but now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. In other words, you don't need a mediator where you've got one party. You only need a mediator when you've got two. So he goes on to lay a foundation. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. So you have to now ask yourself two questions. Can the law nullify the promise? Sectioned up to 18? No, it can't. Yes, OK, that's all right. But is it contrary to the promise? Verse 21. No, he said it's not. It can't be contrary to the promise because law cannot bring you righteousness. Only the promise can. So it's not contrary. What we might say is contrary, as we say it in some places. And so it's important to see that um, for if a law had been given which was able to impart life, righteousness would indeed have been based on law, but the scripture has shut up, and that's the expression to put in prison, has, shut, has confined all men under sin, sin is a power here, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ or out of the faith of Jesus Christ, could be the same Greek there, might be given to those who believe. So what does, what's happened is the scripture has confined or shut up all men and women under law, under sin rather, under the power of sin, until the promise of faith should come through Jesus. Now he then adds this extraordinary statement. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Shut up in the sense of we couldn't see it, we didn't know it. And therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under the tutor. So he sees law as a temporary thing, something which has come through Moses until Christ. He's saying when Christ comes, that, that, that what, what was the function of law? It showed us that we were under the power of sin because the law shows you what sin is and that you are unable to do it and unable to perform it. So you're under a power. In which case, if that's the case, from law to Christ, we're closed up under law. And in that sense, like little children who have a professional tutor who tells them when to rule their page properly and put the date on and do the things that tutors do... <laughs> That law is a tutor that leads us to this mature place of Christ. And now that we've grown up and we're no longer under law but under grace, then we are no longer children. We are mature people who are now living by faith in God with a righteousness that comes by promise through Abraham direct to us, which includes the Holy Spirit. That's the argument. Now he applies it. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you, now that's important, you're not sons of faith into Jesus Christ, but by faith in Jesus Christ. What does this mean? <laughs> really important question. <coughs> the Greek word to believe is pistuo. And it's normally, followed, it's normally followed by a preposition. Now, you know when you use a word like, uh, we're going to run over the hill. Now, this is a preposition, over the hill. We're going to run under the water. We're going to run under the stream. We, all these are prepositions. And the running, these are telling you how we run or where we run or in what way we run. They express that. When you speak about believing into Jesus Christ, that's the word used for converting faith. So you believe us, in this case, Christos, 
This takes the accusative case. But this is not saying this. This is saying that you are all, uh, you are all um, sons of God through faith, comma, in Jesus Christ. That is, you are in Christo. Now this means that it's here you are sons of faith in this conglomerate. It's not, have, not faith in Jesus. That would be faith unto or towards or that's the object of our faith. So if, we're, if I'm believing in, in, in Sophia, I'm believing towards her in Greek. I, I have, that's the way the, the preposition would be expressed. Now what's important here is this is in. So this is with saying, you're all sons of God here in Christ Jesus. So that's quite important. But, but it's through faith and it's in Christ Jesus. So through faith tells you the means and in Christ Jesus tells you the corporate context in which you can so be called. Is that all right? Quite an important text. Not easy to understand. <clears throat> For all of you who were baptised into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Notice that the, the metaphors are now beginning, he's beginning to mount and mix the metaphors. You've been baptised into Christ, well then you have clothed yourself. You've put on Christ as your clothing. You've, you're dressed in Christ. Now there is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free man, there's neither male or female, you're all one in Christ. Christ Jesus. So in this collective sense here, in this setting here, we don't consider whether there are people are slaves or free or whether they're men or women or whether they are Jew or Greek. All those things are obliterated because in Christ Jesus all these things count for nothing. They're distinctions that no longer matter. In other words, we've just obliterated the difference between, in Christ Jesus, between us, a Jew and a Gentile. Now look where he goes with this argument. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abram's offspring, heirs according to promise. Notice that you're an heir, not according to law. That would be a will or a testament, but according to promise. Now he makes an application which is the most wonderful thing you've ever read. It's most, uh, if, you, if you get this, you, you crack it wide open. Now I say, this is what he wants to say, and the picture you have of this, lots and lots of Romans who are wealthy employed Greeks, learned Greeks, to look after their children and tutor them. They were essentially house teachers. They were a governor or a governess. In this case, a governor, because they're mostly men. And you'd employ, you'd employ a, Greek, a Greek man, you'd pay him a fee, and he would look after your children and he'd teach them their Aristotle and their Plato and their, and their maths and their trigonometry and all that, and he would do that little children, and he would govern them. So they are governed under a tutor. He's used the word tutor about the law, keeping us under sin. Now he's going to use this picture. I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is the owner of everything. So when you're looking at a little boy or little girl who is the heir of the house, they're just little kids who have to be governed by a, a person who's employed to teach them their maths. He's under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So I presume when dad comes along and says to the Greek man, thank you for educating my children, I'm now moving him from your care, he's moving on to the farm and he's going to manage my property and now he is the man in charge. Hello, hello. Well, then he ceased to be under the Greek tutor because his father sets that date. Notice he does not graduate and he doesn't have to please the Greek tutor. The Greek tutor teaches him as long as his, as his father wants him to. This is very powerfully laid out in the story of Alexander the Great, but I won't bore you with it. But it's important to notice that Alexander's father... Uh, who was Philip of Macedon, he employed Aristotle to teach Alexander. And then he gave him three years. And he said, after that, come with me. <laughs> and and, we, and you're going you're gonna to lead my armies. 
Now, that's the picture. Guardians, managers, children, right? So also we, we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. This is, this is the Greek expression, ta stoikia to kosmu, the things, the elemental ex- the elemental things, the ABCs of the world, the basic principles of the world. We were held there. And he said, but when the fullness of time came forth, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, that is to say, a human, born under the law, that is to say, under law. For what purpose? In order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption or sonship, would be perhaps a better translation. Luther goes long and loud for many pages upon sonship, not adoption. You appreciate why. Adoption implies you were never a son, and now you've been adopted. This whole text is telling you you were always a son, a child of God, and have come to maturity. See the difference? Very important distinction. Uh, Very strong in North America, that distinction about adoption. So Luther goes on about it from the perspective that Paul should have used different words when he was describing this, or our English interpretation of the word puts in that idea of adoption as a poor choice of English words. Yes, the latter. Okay. Yeah, the Greek so word is... Yes, yes. The Greek, the Greek word for a son is huios. This is a... This is a rough breathing up. Huios. And the Greek word for... Well, sonship is huiothesia, built on the same word. And, 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 and this is what we, we are, we have come to huiothesia. We've come to full, mature sonship. Because a son is always the son of his father, but is now a mature man. And now he has responsibilities, of course, and he needs to function on the farm or whatever the business is. And so what we're discovering here is we might receive... Adoption of sons, no, uh, better to say that we might receive full, mature sonship. And we go on to see why that's the case. Because we're sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Notice, he says, you, we were always heirs, but we were held under law like under a tutor, when father said, the law bit's over, my son has come, he's redeemed us, brought to us, he's redeemed us out of the law and he's made us into mature sons and daughters of God as a gift. Then the implication is we're no longer under a tutor, therefore no longer under law. He goes on to say that. However, at that time when you didn't know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. He's, of course, now talking to Gentiles. But now that you have become to know God, or rather be known by God, how is it you turn your back again to the weak things, worthless and elemental things, to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I've laboured over you in vain. So he says, so you're going to go back to all the rules, are you? Going to go back to days and seasons and keeping this and keeping that and watching over this and seeing that you don't do that, and you don't eat this, but do eat that. You're going to go back to all that stuff. You're going to go back. That's to go back as if Christ had never redeemed you from this infantile, elemental, basic slavery to the things of the universe, whether you're, if you're a Greek. So he explains, I beg you, brethren, because as I become as I am, for I also have become as you are, meaning I'm a Jew and I've abandoned that in order to actually know the other. You have done me no wrong, but you know that I was because of bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you at the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you didn't despise or loathe. You received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is the sense of blessing you have? I bear you witness, if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. So people have inferred he must have had an eye disease when he first went there. Have I therefore become your enemy by telling you the truth? He's saying, remember how it was at first. We, 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 were, we, we, were, we were together, weren't we? Didn't you understand that I brought you something brilliant and you just would have plucked out your eyes for me? What's changed? Well, what's changed is these dudes have come. 
Have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? They, and now he talks about these who've come, they, they eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out in order that you may seek them. Meaning they want to exclude you from this wonderful liberty and grace that Christ has brought so that you will seek and chase after them. He says, it's, a, it's, it's good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner, not only when I'm present with you, my children with whom I am again in labour, again until Christ is formed in you, but I would wish to be present with you now and change my tone, because I'm perplexed about you. So he's, he's, he's getting heavy, but he understands, I wish I was there, I could change my tone. So he has some questions. Tell me this. You who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? Let's just do a bit of a... Let's just see what you're going back to, shall we? Hmm? Shall we do that? <laughs> this is pretty serious. It was written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. The bondwoman would be Ishmael and the bondwoman, Hagar, would be his mother. And Sarah is the, is the mum of Isaac. But the son by the bondwoman, Ishmael, was born according to the flesh. And the son by the free woman through the promise. Can you see that we've got Galatians is now setting us up for um, Romans 9? This is all the same argument. Romans 9 will pour, pour this out. This is allegorically speaking, so he's going to now speak. These two women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children to slavery. She is Hagar. So she represents the law. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia corresponds to the present Jerusalem for she is in slavery with her children so the Jews of the present Jerusalem are following the law and they are really behaving as children of Hagar in this allegory but the Jerusalem above is free and she's our mother for it's written rejoice barren woman who does not bear break forth and shout you who are not in labour for more are the children of the desolate that is of the empty those in the desert than one who has had a husband that's a statement with reference to Sarah. You children like Isaac are children of promise. But as at that time, what do we find? He who was born according to the flesh, Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, Isaac. And so it's the case now, because along are coming these people from Jerusalem who are persecuting you and me because we are the children of promise and they are the children of the flesh and so it's just repeating the same, the, same, the same historical sequence. And what's he saying is, what, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall have not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. And you should now read 5.1 to go straight on top of that argument. For it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Do not go back to law. If you do that, granted Christ died for nothing, but you've already experienced the freedom of the Spirit and you know exactly that you are a child of promise and that it's come to you through Abram by faith and by hearing with faith. Is that all right? Can you see where the argument's running? Everybody okay with this? Good. It would be like running back to the tutor saying, I don't want to run my father's house. Yeah. Just keep just teaching keep, me. Just keep teaching me, yeah. I don't want the responsibility of freedom. Mm. And, and actually, you're right, he anticipates that very argument because he goes on to say, you have been given liberty. But as you all know, and well, not, not you all, we all know, I do too, liberty is much harder to live than slavery. Slavery is a piece of cake. You just do what you're told. If you can cope with that, it's easy. But if you're liberty, you have to be responsible, think for yourself, understand what the, what, what, what's the matter, what, what, what am I engaged in here? Freedom is a much harder road to live than slavery in the context of effort. And now he goes just to that very issue that you raised, Joni. Behold, I, Paul, say to you, that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Now, you've got to be careful here. He's not saying, for example, a Jew who is circumcised, or sometimes there are Gentile men who are circumcised. Uh, he's saying, uh, you can't be circumcised and be a Christian. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, if you know Christ, 
and you know Christ as after the promise and you accept circumcision as somehow getting you into the very people of God, then Christ is of no value to you. You've just turned your back on him. I testify against, again to every man who receives circumcision that he's under his obligation to keep the whole law. So it must be these people said when they turned up, you need to be circumcised, fellas. Unless you are, you're not within the covenant people of God. He said, don't do it. You have been severed from Christ. <coughs> oh, strong words now. You have been severed from, cut off from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Notice it's a fall to go back to law. <laughs> for we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. In Christ Jesus, there is neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. It's faith working through love. Now be careful about that. But get the first part first. 6a tells us, whether you're circumcised or not, in Christ Jesus, it's, an, it's, it's a non-issue. It's just a nothing. Don't ever worry about it. If you are, then you are. And if you're not, don't seek to be. His whole point is it's just not, not a thing to worry about. Because it's neither that nor it's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision that matters, but faith working through love. Now this is a very problematical text, and it's not been well understood by many people. When you come to this text, you need to recognise that the question you have to ask yourself is, um, in 5.6 five, uh, five, of Galatians, the thing you have to ask yourself is, what does it mean? Faith working through love. Or faith through love working. Is faith giving rise to love or does love give rise to faith? Most people will tell you it's the second in life. They'll say, if you don't love people, you won't trust them. Actually, it's the reverse. If you don't trust them, you won't love them. In other words, faith comes first and it works. Faith does its work through love working. So this is quite an important text to understand. What he's actually saying is, in Christ, it's not a matter of circumcision and circumcision. It's about faith. It's about trusting, and that that faith works through love. That is, the way in which it expresses itself is through love. You can see why this is the case. The minute you are okay with God by trust, as a gift well, then you are set free to love people. Because in actual fact, there's no competition, there's no, there's no need to consider where they are or you are, there are no boundaries. Um, once you're okay with God, you're okay with yourself. And if you're okay with yourself, you're okay with loving anybody. You can throw your life away and love others once you know that you're all right with God and there's nothing to be gained by loving Right. So you don't love people in order to be acceptable to God. Faith is that which causes us as a means to lay hold of the work of Christ, which is make, makes us acceptable to God, and then we're set free to love people. You can be loving as long as you live by faith. Faith works through love. Or faith working through love would be the way to say it. Quite an important thing, that. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion, you know, does not come from him who calls you, saying it's not of God. And be careful, a little leaven, little yeast, leavens the whole lump of dough. Don't, don't let it in the door. I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will adopt no other view. But the one who is disturbing you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. Whoever's telling you this stuff to go back to law, he'll fall under the judgment of God because he's dealing with stumbling Christ's little ones. That's what he's doing. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, let me ask you this. Why am I still persecuted? 
then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. See, the real objection they have with Paul is he preaches a crucified Messiah, which they think is dishonouring. He says, no, that's the very honouring thing. He dies for us. Hello. <laughs> so he says, so if, I'm still, if I still preach circumcision, if I, was, if I was still saying what they're saying, they wouldn't be persecuting me, would they? No. The thing that really gets up their nose about what I preach is I preach Christ crucified. Now, you've got to understand that. When he preaches Christ crucified, he doesn't just mean Christ crucified. He means Christ, the crucified Messiah. Now, that really gets up the nose of the Orthodox Jew. He says, you're saying that our Messiah is a crim, uh, that he died on a public gallows? Uh, no way. God is exalting this one. He is the best and best ever. Paul says he is indeed the best and best ever, but after he's been crucified and raised... Because that's how he frees us. That's the salvation. They're saying, we don't get that. He says, well, no wonder you want to go back to law. Now he says, would those that are in trouble you would even mutilate themselves? Hmm. So that's a pretty sarcastic comment that um, as circumcision takes off the foreskin of the penis, what he's actually saying is, I think they should mutilate. They're into mutilating people. <laughs> they should do it to themselves. <laughs> in other words, what he's saying is, it's just mutilation now. It's not meaningful for where we are, it's just a meaningless statement. And no, it's not meaningless actually. He's saying if you do do it, you sever from Christ. You can't have both. You can't be justified by law and justified by grace both at once. It's either or. And he's shown that historically. It's either by law or it's by the promise to Abraham, but it can't be both. It's either by promise or by or by works, but it can't be both. You've got to see where Paul is so strong about this. Now he explains his... Uh, now that's, so the first indicative is, it was for freedom that Christ set you free. Don't go back to a, a yoke of slavery. That would be returning to that slavery, which is immature, tutorish, and will be, would imply you're under sin. Now he gives a second indicative. For you were called to freedom, brethren, so he states that's what you are called to. Now he gives the imperative. Do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So there are two possibilities here, aren't there? He says, um, I want to tell you that you're free. Well, for goodness sake, don't return to slavery on the left. And I want to tell you that you're free. And for goodness sake, don't make your freedom a license to do whatever you want. Licentiousness and legalism are both denied you. You need to express your freedom through the middle of formal legalism and licentious do-as-you-like rubbish. He said both of those are extreme positions. He said you are called to freedom, but don't make an opportunity for the flesh. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement you shall love your neighbour as yourself. So if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. But I say this, and here's the imperative, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. They are mutually exclusive. For these are in opposition to one another, says the same thing, now the adverbial clause of result, so that you may not do the things that you please. That is, God has presented you with an either or, either the flesh or following the Spirit, but it can't be both. And you're normally pleased to do the flesh. You're biased to go that road. So the Spirit's in there to um, wave his flag and say, come over here and follow me. Not that. <laughs> That's default. This is what the new life is. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit. But if you are led by the Spirit, now that is the picture of a led like a shepherd leads sheep in the Middle East. If the Spirit is walking ahead of you, um, then you're not under the law. The, the, the Spirit will lead you wherever he wills, but that's not under the law. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident. By the way, you should know what that means. If the Spirit leads you, you will not be lawless, nor will you be licentious. Right? What he's, he's, he's saying, but, what, but, it's not, but it's not under law. If the Spirit leads you, go where he wills, but you'll go freely, 
happily and as a free person, with freedom and as a true son, true, mature child of God. If you do that, he says, you're not under law. But, it won't, but he won't lead you to be lawless. he would never do that. And now he gives them some tests so they could know what they're into. The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, which are hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions. Factions are parties. A lot of our comments last Thursday night, there's lots of parties in the church already. Envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, this is not saying that a Christian who does that loses his kingdom. What he's saying is the sort of people who inherit the kingdom of God don't do this stuff. So this is a statement of class. Is that all right? Which of us have not fallen over on that? Have we not envied someone or we might have even been drunk? We might have been impure. We may have been into sensuality. Does this mean we've lost our salvation? Not at all. He's not saying that. What he's saying is, I want you to follow the spirit because if not the flesh. Now, the flesh is this sort of stuff. And people who do that are not people who normally inherit God's kingdom. But the fruit of the spirit, you should know about that. That's love and joy and peace, which are things with reference to yourself. Patience, kindness and goodness, faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Against such things there's no law. That is, no law will condemn these beautiful gifts of the Spirit because they fulfil law, for goodness sake. So then, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Notice that extraordinary expression. Those who belong to Christ, that is, those who are of Christ, they have crucified the flesh. Now, what this means is that they, not that they have put it to death, they are putting it to death, but to have crucified the flesh is to hang it on a cross. And it takes a heck of a long time to die. So it's really important to understand they've taken a stance about this thing. About this flesh thing, they've crucified it. They've said, you're going up on a cross and you're going to die a slow death, but you're going to die. That's what people who are Christians have said to their flesh. Is their flesh in fact dead? No, it's still kicking around. Have they got an attitude towards it which is final? Yes, because you put people on crosses, it is final. They don't come back, that's the understanding. So this is the view of our flesh. So what he's saying is, that's, what, that's our attitudinal place and that's where we've put it, its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another or envying one another. So this is a most remarkable text, Galatians. It's telling us about... I'm going, to, I'm going to finish here. I don't want to do the sixth chapter. There's too much in it to just knock it, knock, knock it away in a minute. So what we notice is he has said, you need to deal with me, chapter 1, as a proper apostle who's been sent from Christ. I do have authority to speak the gospel, and the gospel I speak is the real ridgy ditch one. I can show you that because I did it by revelation of Jesus Christ and I didn't consult the other apostles and I didn't learn it and I'm not spouting what they say, although they didn't say anything problematic about what I preach. Chapter 2. I did correct Peter about these matters, you know, at Antioch, and I said to him that he shouldn't yield to the Jewish situation to eat kosher in front of Gentiles. That's just going to force them to become Jewish in their style. I am very surprised, he says, that you're turning away because you've had such a fantastic knowledge of the spirit and of the miracles and power of God. And I want to tell you about Abram, through, whose, through whom the promise has come to us Gentiles by faith that we receive Holy Spirit. Uh, he wants us to know that um, a covenant or a promise to Abram cannot be changed by law. 
in which case the law can't undo the promise, but nor does it fulfil the promise, nor is it contrary to the promise. So what's the point of the law? It was added to sort of shut us up, to show that we are caught in sin and law teaches us that. You only ever learn that by law. Try and do law, you'll soon know if you're under the power of sin. It'll just make it pretty obvious. So the law he sees as a tutor who's hold, holding us for quite some time until the Father said, enough, bring on the maturity, the enter Christ, who brings us and becomes a... Uh, uh, he redeems us from the curse of the law. Uh, he becomes a person who, uh, who the law leads us to him, makes us desire him, and on that score we have... We have become heirs through Christ, and if heirs, well, then we have Abram's promise. Chapter 4, we are children who are like under a tutor, but now we've come to a full, full-blown full maturity in Christ of sonship, and therefore we should not return to children's games. We should not return to want to go back to rules. We are not, as we often say psychologically, we are not regressing Back to being a child, we are holding and accepting mature, responsible, adult positions that Christ has won for us. And, but do you notice, who persecutes us? It's the people who are in the business of law. Just like Hagar's son ruffled up Sarah's boy, so it is that we're ruffled up. In which case, he says, cast them out, just get rid of it. And his understanding is, because it was for freedom, you've been set free. It's a wonderful expression, that. <coughs> when you're set free, you're set free for freedom, not set free from bondage. You're set free from that in order to be free for that. Now, what Paul is always going to tell you is, everybody is very happy to be set free from a bondage. Not everybody is very able to cope with the fact that they're set free for freedom because freedom is more difficult to live than bondage in the sense of it's more demanding, it's more mature. It requires a maturity which is not the child's. Children live by rules, adults live by spirit, fundamentally. And so he's telling them that they should uh, not fall into the place then of a formalism or a legalism or a licentiousness. They need to steer through that middle and not be in the middle in the sense of just bland, but he means follow the spirit. How would you know if you're following the spirit? Well, it won't be according to the flesh. What's the flesh look like? Here's a list. Brrr. What does the spirit look like in its fruit? Here's the list. Brrr. And if that's the case, then you should understand, verse end of chapter 5, that if you belong to Christ, you've dealt with your, fa your passions and you've made an attitudinal position towards that. So far, so good. You okay with this? It's always helpful to get the argument in one shot. As soon as you see the argument flow, you can start to... S and if you ever find the, the text, and there are difficult texts in Galatians, there's no question, then the argument often sorts you. If you know the, the full flow and can repeat it in your head and say, this is where he's going, and this is how he's arguing, well, then often you can, exp you can understand difficult texts in the light of the argument flow, not the other way around. Otherwise, what will happen is contentiousness over certain texts makes you lose the power of the argument. And I found this early in my Christian life. I was in, got involved in a whole lot of people who are extremely contentious people and, and, and textually very clever. They drove me out of my mind. But, but, but in the end, I just found I got into arguments and then I realised, hey, wait on, this is not the real argument. I should be listening to what the Apostle actually says in the broad before I come to look at the particulars, because there are some picky arguments over particulars which are actually dissolved by understanding the argument in the broad. So I'm a great believer in getting, you know, be able to say, what's Galatians about? Well, let's put down seven points and we've got it. I, I want that in my, in my mind, because then that shapes me to see and also to recognise the same ideas when they pop up in Romans. So when I read scriptures, I don't recall texts, although I have a memory for texts. I don't do that. I work in what I call, what some people call sense units. I just see what the next step is and what's the big picture 
and that picture's leading onto this one. Then there's an allegory about Hagar and Sarah, and I get the idea of that, and I see where he's going. And so I've got a sense of the whole before I approach the parts. It helps you a great deal when you come to look at those difficult texts like, is it the faith in Christ or the faith of Christ you live by? Now, the Greek grammar does not sort you. Matter of fact, it argues for the faith of Christ. So you have to think, oh, which is it? Now, there are about six or seven of these in Paul's epistles. They're laid out by a Cambridge professor called Mona D. Hooker. Um, professor Hooker is a really learned lady, and she laid out this, this long text of all these things, and she showed they were all off. They were very helpful. Anyway, another thing. But, but that sort of high detail work, I think you do after you've got the pattern. Also that you talk to Jewish people really well. Because they'll say, you know, the, the law is the thing. It came through Moses. It's the law, the law, the Torah, the Torah. You'd say, yes, yes, and you honour that. But then you show, start talking history. Did it come after the promise or did it come before? Oh, I haven't thought about that. Well, that's actually crucial. Um, how do they understand father, Abraham? How is he our father? In what sense, father? Well, I'll go for seed, as in sperm. But we'd have to say, well, wait on. All the nations are going to be blessed through this. How do we understand that? And as a whole, once you have Paul's big, big pictures, you, you can sit down and talk quietly around a table without getting agitated and without dealing with text. Keep the New Testament in your head and you can talk it anyway. Anyway, we celebrate this tonight. Lord Jesus Christ, we worship you as the mediator between man and God. We praise you that you have come and that your work has taken up the curse for us. We also praise you, you freed us from law in order that we might be free for Christ. We thank you that you are the seed of Abraham in whom all the whole earth has been dealt with. Help us, we pray, to take fully our freedom. We're sorry for those many places and times when we have lived as preferring, really, to, to go back to slavery because it's easier, where there are rules, and someone will tell us how to rule our lines, and someone will advise us and poke us in the back if we don't do it well. Lord, so often we want to go back to that way of life because it seems more secure, it seems more dependably obvious, but how we praise you that it is for freedom that you've set us free. And we'd like to ask you to have courage to embrace the freedom in Christ Jesus and to deal with flesh and to decide to <clears throat> follow the Spirit and be led by him and to know the wonderful fruit of his person in our life. We do thank you for every experience we've had of love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and patience and self-control. These are things which are alien to our persons but are your gift to us by the Spirit. <clears throat> and they make us to be like Christ in the way he lived. Help us to seize these things with joy and to not yield them to other things. We ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Mm.